Good morning. Welcome to Voice in the Wilderness Ministries. We thank you for taking the time to listen to our message for a few minutes, and we pray that it inspires you to go out and make a difference for the kingdom of God. And if you're searching for the truth, the gospel of Jesus Christ will always be the light in the darkness that you can find your way home. We're presenting to you a picture of the altar that I came down when I realized I needed Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I came to that altar because my life was a mess. My life had been a mess, and going forward, my life would be a mess. And certainly the thought of eternity was something I did not want to deal with. On February 14, 1987, I gave my heart, my life, my soul, and all my hopes and dreams, and I laid them at the lap of the one who sits at the right hand of the throne of God. I walked down that center aisle you're looking upon right now of the First Christian Church in Lufkin, Texas, and laid down at the altar of that church to ask for the forgiveness of my sins and to ask Jesus Christ to be Lord of my life. I was born again. In the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 3 through 6, the Bible says, Most assuredly, I say unto you, except a man is born again, or unless a man is born again, he's not going to see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus, who was visiting Jesus that night, who was a scholar, a leader of the people, and a representative of the word to the people, had no idea what Christ was talking about when he said, how can, a, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb? And Jesus said, Most assuredly I say unto you, except a man is born of water and of the Spirit, he is not going to enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Over 37 years after that divine appointment, I can still recall with as much memory of that dramatic turning point in my life with as much clarity as yesterday. As I was sitting in that church with my family, suddenly the love of God consumed me and I sensed the wretchedness of my own wickedness. The Holy Spirit's conviction of sin overwhelmed me until I could stand it no longer. I raced down that aisle and gave my life to Christ, and I have never, ever looked back. In John chapter 3, verses 14 through 17, Jesus, once again, speaking to Nicodemus, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now, he's referring to an event that happened in Numbers 21, verse 9, when the sins of the people brought the judgment of snakes upon the people. So Moses made a bronze snake, and whoever looked upon that bronze snake would not die from the snake bites with which were occurring. Verse 15. That whosoever, so Jesus, let me start this again. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, that's the event he's referring to, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. The Lord is also very gracious to me in the fact that He has allowed me to recall the things that brought me to that place of decision. Not to hold it over my head in guilt, but to remind me of the tremendous price that was paid for my salvation. Freedom is never free. 
It cost somebody everything, even the ultimate sacrifice of death itself. Liberty is generally provided through the death of something. And to provide that liberty, someone has to go above and beyond human understanding so that we may understand the price that was paid for our sin, the price that was paid for our liberty as a nation. Somebody provided that liberty for you. It is not an endowment. It is not a title entitlement. It is a privilege from the hand of God, from the heart of God, from the mind of God, to provide the sacrifice that makes spiritual liberty. With God, nothing happens by coincidence, accidents, luck, circumstance, or random chance. These invaluable lessons are the impetus that has helped preserve my walk with Him to this day and are the basis for the message with which this ministry presents our message to the world. In my darkest days as a sinner, as an alcoholic, as a drug addict, among many other egregious sins, iniquities, transgressions, and outright defiance of the morality of God, I would turn on the television and evangelist Billy Graham would teach and preach the truth of God's words with the kind of spiritual authority you seldom witness today in the carnival sideshow that has become the Christian faith. His infectious, contagious, fire-fueled words left an indelible mark on my soul that remains to this day and is the benchmark for the preaching I pray one day I can attain as well. This call of the gospel originates from none other than Jesus Christ. This or there is no excuse. A church without the gospel is nothing more than a religious community of people that look to do this for all the wrong reasons. Soul winning is the mandate Christ has always had for his church and for the believers. In Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, the Bible says, All authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth. Go therefore, you go therefore, and teach all nations, make disciples of them, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. In Mark 16, verses 15 and 16, the Bible says, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned. Ultimately, we must choose this liberty. I know there is a doctrine permeating through the earth, it has since the time of Christ, called universalism. That Christ's atoning death makes everybody saved. Not according to the words of Christ. You must make a choice. I made that choice. I made that choice based on understanding the cost of my salvation. I freely chose something that cost God everything. And the flippant attitude towards this particular aspect of the Christian faith is going to cause the demise of multitudes of well-meaning but biblically ignorant people that think they're on their way to heaven to march into the bowels of hell without ever realizing it. Except a man is born again. He is not going to enter the kingdom of God. In Mark 24, or excuse me, Luke 24, verses 46 through 48, the Bible says, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in all nations, begin in his name, in all nations, beginning here at Jerusalem, and you are witnesses of these things. Christ has called us to preach the repentance and remission of sins in the name of Jesus Christ to all nations. There is no excuse for someone who does not understand that these words come from the throne of God. It is our job to preach repentance and remission of sins to all nations with all of the vessels and the vehicles and the 
the vices that God has given you. Our voice must be the voice of salvation. Our voice must be the voice of redemption. Our voice must be the voice of reconciliation between man and God. We present to this world Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, and God's manifest love towards you, and the fact that His death paid the price for your sins, not His sins, your sins, and the door is open, the veil is torn, and reconciliation be, can come, be available to anybody that simply calls upon the name of the Lord and they shall be saved. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 17, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the message of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. In 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 2, the Bible says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, I did not come with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. We need to return to that. We need to go back to that. We need to remember that. It is the words of Christ that contain the power to change. It is the Spirit of God in the application of those words through faithful stewards that change. There are no ten-word answers to everybody's problems. It is a transforming work of God culminating in conversion, a complete conversion from the old nature to the in nature. While I was living in sin and the trappings of this world, it was the image of Christ, it was the image of the cross, and what it represented that drove me closer to that decision for Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ meant something far different back then than it does now, even though the same message should apply now. In times of difficulty, I still look to that cross and that empty tomb. And in those precious moments, I find peace in life's most difficult storms. In my heart, I know that the cross and the tomb were the cost of my salvation. But back then, this was a very different narrative in the Christian faith than it is now. The ministers preached the gospel with a fire and a passion for the lost souls of this world. In contrast, it appears that the narrative of our faith has digressed into worldly people pleasing platitudes that prioritizes the absence of absolute sin. The Bible warns us of that type of ministry. <coughs> Excuse me. What Isaiah said in Isaiah 30, verse 10, This is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord, which say to the seers, See not. And unto the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things, prophesy unto us smooth things. Well, pastor, that's the Old Testament. Listen to the words of Jesus Christ in Matthew 15, verses 8 and 9, when he said, Well, did Isaiah prophesy unto you when he said, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. For in vain they do worship me, in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. In vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. In Colossians 2, verse 8, the Bible says, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. After the tradition of men, according to the tradition of men, according to the principles of this world, and not after Christ. In 1 Timothy 6, 3 through 4, the Bible says, If any man teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, 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 they are proud, knowing nothing, but obsessed with disputes and arguments over words, which comes envy, strife, and evil suspicion. A mutual antagonism exists between the wisdom of this world 
and the wisdom of God. And the conflict shows up supremely in the cross of Christ. God works most wisely and more powerfully in ways that are directly opposite to the human expectation. It is the words of God found in the Holy Scriptures that ignite the Holy Spirit to put a fire in the hearts of a man to change. Contained in the Word of God is the power to change the world, but if it's not properly discerned, it's of none effect. In Romans 10, 13 through 17, the application is extremely powerful. For whosoever, verse 13 of Romans 10, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him and whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe on him in whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it, for it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. It is the word of God. The Word of God under the direction of the Holy Spirit that enacts the power from the throne of God unto salvation. It is not the gimmicks that men use in this generation to appeal to the baser instincts of men to draw them into their ministry without requiring a change in conduct and morality. God has chosen His, his words anointed by His Spirit by faithful people entrusted with its care and with its preservation that makes a difference in a lost and fallen world. In Hebrews 4, verse 12, the Bible says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. But is the image of an old rugged cross and an empty tomb that brings to remembrance the source of the hope of my faith. The dread, the terror, and the horror of that old rugged cross reminds me of the cost of God's love for me. Conversely, the joy at the sight of the empty tomb and the liberation from the bondage of the fear of death pushes me to continually minister these words that hope is found in. Consider the tombs of the gods or the messengers of God has supposedly sent. These are the people that men follow in the last hundred years or so. The grave of Muhammad the prophet, the founder of Islam. You can locate his remains in the lo located in the Green Dome in Medina, Saudi Arabia. Buddha, who is actually named Siddhartha Gautama, the founder of Buddhism, you can locate his remains in a grave in Jiantan County, China. Confucius, whose real name is Kong Kuo, a philosophical teacher and founder of Confucianism, you can locate his remains in his grave in the cemetery of Kwafu Shandong, province, China. Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism and the Latter-day Saint movement, you can locate his remains in the grave in the Smith Family Cemetery, Smith Family Cemetery in Nauvoo, Illinois. Charles Robert Darwin, the highly exalted geologist and biologist known for his contributions to evolutionary biology, you can locate his remains in the grave at Westminster Abbey in London, England, near the grave of Sir Isaac Newton. Lafayette Ron Howard, the founder of Scientology and latter the Church of Scientology, died in 1986, was cremated, and his ashes were scattered over the Pacific Ocean. Charles Taze Russell, founder of the Watchtower Tract Society, which later adopted the name Jehovah's Witnesses. You can find his remains in his grave in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. <coughs> Mary Baker Eddy, excuse me, 
and the founder of the Church of Christ, scientist, and the Christian Science Monitor. Her remains are in the grave at Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge, Massachusetts. All of their physical bodies um, remain embalmed or cremated, but in the city of Jerusalem on a street called Straight, in the borrowed grave of one Joseph of Arimathea, and it is an empty grave and a sign that hangs above the door, He is risen. He is not here. He is risen. That is the broadside in the waterline for me. I refuse to submit to the possibility of equal valued religions or ideals unless they have an unburied body to resurrect life from the dead. Jesus Christ represents life from the dead. Jesus Christ represents life and victory and dominion over sin, and no other religion can offer that, and there's no point in arguing any other point any further than that. Jesus Christ is the Son of God, sent by God for the sacrifice, for the forgiveness and remission of our sins. That has been our message. As long as there is an empty tomb in the straight street of Jerusalem, no other religion offers any validation for their opinion. Now, we be kind and we love all people, but we do not surrender our devotion because of the cost that was paid for our salvation. In John 11, verses 25 and 26, the Bible says, Jesus speaking, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth on me shall never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life? That if you believe on him, though you were dead, in spirit you shall live. And whosoever liveth and believeth on me shall never die, but eternal life will live in him from this point forward unto the, into eternity. For the person that believes in Jesus Christ, physical death is not a tragic end. It is instead the gateway to an abundant eternal life and everlasting communion with God. Yet shall he live refers to our resurrection. The shall never die means the resurrection believer shall never die. He will have a new body, immortal, incorruptible, a body that cannot die or deteriorate. The most joyful dynamic of the gospel of Jesus Christ is the ultimate victory we obtain in the resurrection from the dead and subsequent ascension to the Father. It is incumbent upon every minister not just to preach about the cross but we alone, but we must always provide the hope of the resurrection from the dead as well. The most glorious aspect of the gospel is that death did not hold him, but he was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. Even so, we should walk in this promise as well. And Romans 6, 3 through 7, the Bible says, Know ye not that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized unto his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism unto death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that we should hence not serve sin. For he that is dead is free from sin. Now if we believe we are if, now if we be dead with Christ, we believe we shall also live with him. And 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 22. But if Christ is risen from but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that sleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection from the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ Jesus shall all be made alive. In Ephesians 2, verses 5 and 6, the Bible says, For when we were dead in our sins, God hath made us alive together in Christ. For by grace are you saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. In Philippians 3, 10 through 11, the Apostle Paul preaches that I may know Christ, that I may know Christ, that I may know Christ, and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being made conformable unto His death, if that by any means I myself might attain 
unto the resurrection of the dead. Simon Peter speaks of it in 1 Peter 1, verses 3 through 5. The Bible says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who were kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last day. In 1 Peter 1, verse 21, the Bible says, Who by Christ, being the believer who by, who by Christ, do believe in God that raised Christ up from the dead and gave Him glory that your faith and hope may be in God. Let me explain how this works. In 1 Corinthians 15, verses 40 through 44, There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is the glory of the sun, and another a glory of the moon, and another the glory of the stars, and one star different from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. Well, preacher, how's that? We'll just go a little further in 1 Corinthians 15 and he will explain the process. This corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, grave, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, grave, where is your victory? The sting of sin is death, and the strength of sin is a law. But thanks be unto God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The bloody cross and the empty tomb are the points of light that live in my heart and keeps me from the trappings and temptations of this dark, corrupt, and devious world that we live in. But these lights are meant to shine as the beacon from a lighthouse into the darkness of this sordid world. It is the message placed in our heart by the Holy Ghost as believers that we must share with all the world. We have to return to sharing this message. I know that there's a lot of people that are in ministry or call themselves ministers. or A true minister always keeps this at the forefront of every intention, purpose, or matter of heart. We must reach the lost. And I don't mean abstractly, and I don't mean manipulatively, we must meet them where they are to tell them the cost of the salvation that they elect to take or not take. There is a price with all of this. And God has asked us to be lights into this world with a message of hope and eternal salvation and trusted with us as they were entrusted by Jesus Christ at Pentecost and before His ascension. In Matthew 5, verses 14 and 16, the Bible says, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but they put it on a lampstand, and it gives light to all of the house. Let your light so shine before men that they will see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. In Mark chapter 4, verses 21 and 22, the Bible said, Is a candle brought to be put under a bushel or under a bed, and not to be set on a candlestick? For there is nothing hidden that shall not be manifested, neither is there anything in secret that shall not be known. Every Sunday, hopefully around noon, depending on when we can get it on the air, Central Time, USA, we present to you the gospel of Jesus Christ for the repentance and the remission of sins. We have been entrusted with this call from God Himself and take very seriously His strict adherence to this word. I remember the price 
price paid to save me. And we pray the transitions to hearers and watchers of our message. The problem today is that we are preaching a gospel without repentance, a seeker-friendly, one-size-fits-all message with no submission to God, an empty message devoid of personal transformation. It is the deception of the devil that gives false assurance to condemned people. However, we believe that there are still people wandering in the world of darkness seeking for the truth, and we are going to find them. Make no mistake about this. As long as there is a beat in my heart, we are going to find, we are going to search and find every single person looking for the hope of salvation they know in their heart is true. And we're going to pursue that, whether we have money, whether we don't, whether we, whatever circumstances in life and sickness and in health, our job, our ministry, since we started this, was to reach lost people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we will not bend, bow, or cater to the whims or the opinions of man, whether friend or foe, that seeks to keep us from fulfilling our design purpose that God has called us to do. The blood of Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ, represents the New Testament covenant to all men. It is the pathway out of darkness into the light of Christ forever. We choose to enter this covenant by the light of faith. Our faith is introduced at the confession and repentance of our sins at the cross and is confirmed by the commitment we make to follow Him for the rest of our lives from our hearts. This simple process is God's singular and completely, complete pathway to eternal life in Jesus Christ. But this is a choice that only you can make. I have made my choice for Jesus Christ. I don't need to make another choice for Jesus Christ. My heart is instilled in the gospel of my salvation because I understand the price that was paid for my salvation. I don't need to put on the dog and pony shows and anything that would add to the truth of these words. These words contain the power of eternal life from the dead and the damned and bondage of sin. These words and these words alone can change the heart of a nation, they can change the heart of a city, they can change the heart of a church, they can change the heart of anybody outside of the promises of the liberty and the freedom of God, and we will proclaim that to the ends of the earth. This is God's singular and complete pathway to eternal life in Jesus Christ, but this is a choice that only we can make. In Joel 3.14, the Bible says, Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near the valley of the decision. The day of the Lord is near, near, near the valley of decision. Soon it will be too late to make that decision. Soon there will be no time left to make that decision for Christ. We must make that decision for Christ, and we must de determine in our hearts to receive the tremendous price that was paid for our salvation by faith and vow and commit and dedicate to live our lives to Him for the remainder of our time here on earth. The Holy Spirit creates the sense of the necessity of salvation in the sinner's heart. It is not a work which we can ourselves come up with. Only the work of the Holy Spirit in the seeking heart will bring this to fruition. The Holy Spirit will then bring them to the Word of God, and it is there that they will desire the change in their hearts. Here is what I mean. At this point, when the Holy Spirit is beginning to brood over your soul and spirit, conviction will set in the sinner's heart, and the Holy Spirit will direct them to confess and repent of their sins. And you ask, what is repentance? Repentance is completely changing. Changing your mind towards God and towards yourself. Seeing yourself as a wretched sinner and seeing the holiness and righteousness of God. Taking a strong look at the cross and seeing the heartfelt love of God and the death of the cross and the wonderful love of God and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit will then live in you so you can change the way you live going forward. You must change your attitude and your behavior and your actions from this moment on. But you must, you must say goodbye to the old life. If you remain in your old life, you don't understand what this is all about. You must commit to changing from your old life and entering into the glorious life of Christ. God ordained before, for you before the foundation. But you can't do it on your own. But if you sincerely ask God to help you, 
God will help you. Say, Pastor, I'll never be able to do that. No, you'll not be able to do that. Well, Pastor, why are you saying it? When you surrender to God, there is an impartation of the Holy Spirit into your heart, and He will help you, and He will direct you, and He will lead you out of that past life to the salvation of Jesus Christ. The cross is the entrance to holiness. The Holy Spirit is the conduit which God completes it with. The second thing you must do is believe. The word believe is more than just a simple, insincere statement. It means much more than a one-time static confession. To believe in Christ carries with it three specific elements. Number one, a sure and complete conviction that Jesus Christ is God's only Son and the only Savior for lost humanity. Number two, it is to enter into a self-surrendering fellowship with and complete obedience to Christ for the rest of your life. Number three, it is a fully assured trust in Christ that is both able and willing to bring you to final salvation and into fellowship with God here and eternity. The third thing you must do is commit to follow Him and serve Him faithfully for the rest of your life. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to do that? Have you done that at some point in your life? Are you willing to do that now? Are you ready? Never has this decision been so important. Where do you want to spend eternity? Amos 4.12 says, Prepare to meet your God. In 2 Corinthians 6, verse 2, the Bible says, Now is the acceptable time. Today is the day of salvation. Joshua 24 says, Choose this day who you will serve. Exodus 32, verse 26, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come to me. You must choose. And you must choose now. Much of the Christian message is about the urgency of the hour with which you live in and I live in. We may not have tomorrow. We may not have the time to consider and ponder. We must do the right thing right now. To delay makes the right decision harder to make. Indecision into itself is a personal choice. Not to decide is to decide not to. Decisions are made whether we make them or not. Time decides whether you will or will not, and time always decides against you. This day, you can secure your eternity with Christ and live in peace with God forever, or you can wind up in a much worse and horrifying situation of which there will be no turning around once it comes. Come to Christ. Come to Christ today. Come to Christ now. We ask you as Voice in the Wilderness Ministries to surrender your lives to Jesus Christ and live for Him. I don't care what lot you are. I don't care if you're sitting in a church. If you have not passed through the blood of Jesus Christ, you're no different. There has to be a work of transformation. And in an age where television and social media raise up religious and spiritual superstars, it is only those voices that understand this process that are actually speaking for God. Christ gave us a mandate. He gave us a commission. He gave us all a commission. And eternity is the sum total of your decisions. This is a decision you cannot based on a, be, make based on a personality. This is an intimate, personal, the most intimate, personal decision you will ever make. And it's a decision that will last forever. There is no annulment of this by God. You must choose to serve Him and to love Him forever. We are asking you, and we're going to ask you every single time we have the privilege of doing this, to give your life to Christ and give your life to Christ today. I understand the cost of my salvation. I have done my best to explain the importance and the value of what took place on an old rugged cross that you understand the measure of God's love in offering Christ as a sacrifice for your sins and the glory and the joy with which the empty tomb he rose from represents in eternity for you. I pray that you ponder on these words 
and meditate on these words and give thought to your eternal state because that is why we have been sent by God. We ask you to make that decision for Christ today. Today, right now. Don't delay. Give your life to Christ.